and it looks like we're ready to go. So we're gonna kick things over to Joe D'Amelio with his run of Super Castlevania IV. Woo! Best of luck. Rolling in. Indeed. Rolling in. All right, well, this is Super Castlevania IV, and thanks to the generous donations, Joe's gonna be playing this on hard mode tonight, also known as Second Loop, so he's uh, doing this short little password here just to be able to play on hard mode without having to actually beat the game normally first. So go ahead and give a countdown. Countdown will be to actually starting the timer since we time this by uh, character control, then Joe will uh, start when he needs to. So let's get going in five, four, three, two, one. Go! All right, so the main thing to know about um, Second Loop hard mode in uh, Castlevania 4 is that um, there's more enemies, and a lot of the enemies have more health, but en you do not take more damage, and the bosses are unchanged. So we're definitely going to be seeing that right here in 1-1, just because in an any percent run, he'd be taking a lot of damage boosts forward, but just because there's so many more enemies, he has to... Uh, refrain from that in a lot of places just to uh, conserve health. Yeah, most noteworthy is that a lot of screens have additional flying enemies that just make your life a lot tougher in hard mode. Like, you'll notice the additional bats flying on this screen compared to normal mode. Yeah, he's going to be doing a lot of subtle manipulations of the spawn points for bats all throughout the run, too. All right, so Joe just picked up the cross, which, if everything goes well, is going to be the one and only sub-weapon used throughout the run, just because it does good damage. Uh, travels all the way to the edge of the screen before coming back, so it's pretty easy to get multiple hits with the right placement, and um, soon going to be accumulating. Well, there's his double shot, soon to be followed by a triple shot multiplier. The little trick that he just did was a little re-glitch, uh, a little re, re uh, clip where he just gives more momentum for it. It gives him definitely saving more time. And then invincibility potion just for uh, safety and speed in this room because of the extra skeletons and bats. Those bone, those bone pillars take four hits instead of three in hard mode, so dealing with them is a pretty big challenge in the category. A lot more snake bundles in this area as well. Uh, the one thing about this game is the, I, the items in the hearts, they're all fixed. There's not no RNG whatsoever, no axe drops compared to like the original Castlevania 4s, uh, the uh, Castlevania games. Uh. Yes, yeah, so this screen is quite a bit harder because of the club trolls hanging out in the windows too. He actually is doing some pretty tight uh, cross throws in order to be able to kill them before they uh, before they hit him when he jumps past. Very nice. We are going to need quiet time coming up on the boss in a second because Joe uses an audio cue for yeah, it. as far as when to start throwing his crosses at routing. Very nice. Nice. So yeah, that's the power of the triple shot cross in this game with just at the right um, height and uh, timing. It just wrecks all the bosses in this game in seconds. Nice Triforce, by the way, too. Yeah, that's mandatory. You have to, you know, <laughs> always try to be swag when you finish every stage and collect the orb. All right, so there's a bit of randomness at the start of stage two with the zombie hands poking out of the ground as far as when and where they spawn. Uh, it doesn't take damage if one of them grabs him, but it does make him stop, and that's bad in a speed run. So he's uh, kind of jumping strategically to try to minimize his chances of getting grabbed. Cross placements there to get damage in on these uh, armadillo things. Finish the job with his web. It's worth pointing out that just one of the things that really separates this game from like the Castlevanias on the NES is just how many options you have for movement and combat. Like you can whip in eight directions, you can uh, change your uh, jump um, midair. And that all, I think that all makes this game a lot easier casually, but it makes it really, really hard to speed run because um, when you're trying to make use of all of those uh, movement and combat abilities optimally, it just, it, it's really, really difficult. For this particular screen, the frogs are the main random things he has to deal with because they have two different jump patterns. Yeah, hard 
Pokemon just has so many enemies. You can't see them all. They're just waiting for you. For you. You're just gonna get ambushed, so uh, the amount of crosses that Joe's drawing is very necessary. Again, because of how many more enemies there are too, his heart management, heart being ammo for his uh, for his crosses and other sub weapons is very important too. So say hi to Medusa and say bye to Medusa. Bye Medusa. Bye. So stage two is pretty different in that the boss is in the middle of the stage instead of the, at the end. So the, he doesn't actually have to collect an orb to end the stage like normal. And because of that, he actually gets to carry over his hearts into stage three. So because because he needs more hearts to kill more enemies in hard mode, he's actually doing so. Like in an any percent run, he'd want to uh, not have any hearts so he could just walk right through the heart uh, stealing hand at the start. But yeah, he wants to wants to preserve some. Yeah, especially for stage three coming up, you def uh, it's the stage is really long, and you need every anim every heart that you need gives you all the animation you need for the crosses. And, yeah. If it isn't obvious, the uh, river he's in has a natural current to it that either pushes him forward or backwards, and he had to just reverse. So now he's jumping to uh, to move faster. All right, nice. On to stage three. So again, bone the bone pillars are a lot more annoying in hard mode because of having four health instead of three. Also of note are the mud men. If you happen to get hit by one before you break it apart, it does one extra damage compared to a broken apart mud man. So where possible, if you're going to take a hit, you want to try to break them open first just to save that extra bar of health for later damage. Yeah, and he's going to generally be making that decision based on uh, whether they're moving left or right. Yeah, and then I believe the fireballs also do less damage than the mud men, so we use one of those in order to get invincibility frames to walk past. A lot of extra bone pillars all over the place in this stage. Yeah, playing it a little safe with the stalactites and the last uh, mud men. Oh! At least when uh, taking the death, there's definitely not a good idea. But at least on this stage, there's a backup cross that he could definitely pick up if he chooses that way or in the next screen. Yeah, because unfortunately, back. when you take a death in this game, it uh, not only costs you your whip upgrades, but also your sub weapon and any um, tri double or triple shot multipliers. So if he ever does take a death, he does need to uh, switch to some backup plans to regain his cross, or in some cases, possibly even use a different sub weapon if there isn't a backup cross so within reach. And then the way you get your double or triple shot is just by getting hits with the sub weapon against candles or enemies. So as soon as he gets his cross back, he's gonna start using it as much as possible to get his uh, multipliers back. Because again, those multipliers affect how many crosses he can have on screen at once. And in order to get do all the optimal strats in this run, he needs to have the triple. Yeah, the exact amount is 10 enemies or candle hits with the sub weapon. So then on to stage three, which is a ver mainly a ver for stage three two, which is mainly a vertical climbing stage. Yeah, ordinarily you'd do a boost off that little fuzzy to uh, get up that platform faster, but I leave getting the backup cross requires uh, foregoing that. Okay, so now he's going to start just getting as many hits in again as uh, possible to regain his multiplier. And coming up here, we've got our first really major ring glitch, and got it first try, easy peasy. Easy. That saves a lot of time in stage three, too, because mm -hmm. of uh, cutting out, having to go all the way to the left and back, so even if it takes multiple attempts to uh, to get the ring glitch by jumping over the ring and whipping down to push away from it, um, it it's well, well worth it. Yeah, and what makes that work is when you grab onto a ring in this, the game kind of tries to snap you to the max whip distance in relation to the ring. So when you whip it from above, it kind of just pushes you straight vertically and doesn't know whether to make you drop left or right. Good eyeball Very boost. Nice. nice. Yeah. Fortunate thing about Castlevania 4 too is that there, it's, it's a pretty generous game as far as meat, which is how you recover health. There's uh, small meat that's found in a lot of candles and then large meat, which is generally traditional wall meat from uh, Castlevania. So he's able to 
use that route a lot of that in in order for damage boosting. It's nice to use the uh, glitch right there where he's whipping and throwing the cross at the same time, just saving him uh, just a minimal amount of time, not you know having to whip twice. Just use the sub whip twice. Yeah, the last screen of 3-3 is pretty difficult too, because the, the screen only scrolls one way. If he falls off the bottom of the screen, he's dead. So and there's a lot of pretty easy ways to get knocked out by uh, by skeletons or uh, bats. Right, we need a little bit of quiet for the uh, Vipers, the stage 3 boss. Let's use an audio cue for this. Very nice. Good kill. Yeah, the two Vipers have their own hitboxes and take damage off the same pool and uh, but separately. So yeah, with the right class placements, uh, he's hitting both uh, both heads with the same crosses and doing it in one cycle. I gotta say, some of these jumps that Joe is doing is uh, scaring the heck out of me. <laughs> he's, uh, yeah. he's not only is he doing hard mode, he's making even look even harder. Just it's it's very uh, it's like living on the edge, but it's very exhilarating. And for this particular screen, I know he needs to be a little careful about his cross placements because uh, this game doesn't really handle kind of hitting two different objects at the same time very well. So if he's hitting candles and enemies at the same at the same time with his crosses, sometimes it may the game may prioritize the candle over the enemy, and he needs to react if that happens. Coming up in a second here, we're gonna have to ask you to get off the couch and get into the game for us. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Here we have Puexel, not the one sitting next to me, but the one on your screen. Yep. Another pretty, uh, a boss pretty easily disposed of by a triple cross. And I don't think we've actually introduced ourselves, by the way, too, since we've got a nice auto-scroller showing off the, uh, mode 7 powers of the Super Nintendo. Why don't we do so? So I'm Puexel. I just got destroyed by, uh, by Joe running the game. I'm Scavenger 216. Shin David 07. And I am just a fan. I think this is a good time for a couple of donations. Yeah. Absolutely. We have $5 from Need Sleep. I already donated more money than expected, but it is for a good cause, and someone dared me to jump on a $5 train. I can't ignore something like that. Thanks to all the staff, which makes this event so awesome every time. Thank you for your donation. And then, yeah, and the main thing he was going for during 4-2 is just to try to minimize lag, because um, depending on how he deals with the Medusa heads, like fighting them especially can create extra lag and waste time. Alright, so moving on to 4-3. This is another stage where lag management is a pretty big deal because of the scrolling background. Like, uh, yeah, like you, you could see the lag when he uh, grabbed the rosary to kill the skeletons there. So he picked up the invincibility potion and is just going to walk through as many as he can to reduce lag. I'm not even the one playing. I can feel this lag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the mode 7 plus all the extra sprites from exploding skeletons and the exploding wall things just really lag the game on that. Now we're coming up on one of the more flashy speed tricks in Castlevania 4 2, which is the uh, ceiling zip. So he's got a pretty tight climb to get up here before the rising block cycle cuts it off. And then he's going to try to uh, spawn this bat with just the right timing so that he can uh, do that. Nice. Yeah. That's a frame perfect trick, by the way, too. He's uh, basically getting boosted upwards by getting hit by the bat, right, as he would normally get crushed by the ceiling. And instead of dying, he then gets clipped into the ceiling and zips forward. And I want to say that saves around 10 seconds because of uh, cutting out, having to wait a, uh, an extra cycle on those rising blocks. That's correct. We have Coronet, the, fi the final, final boss of Stage 4. I only get to be a mini boss. You're still the main boss in our hearts. <laughs> <laughs> and then after Coronet's defeated, there's a bit of randomness as far as being able to uh, get what's called the fast orb grab. Let's see. Nice! Hey. Yeah. 
Whether he's able to get that um, depends entirely on just how high up the rising platform is when the orb appears and then the platform disappears. So he has a very tight window to jump to grab the orb before it falls. And that saves a couple seconds too. So stage five is kind of a different, a very different kind of a stage for this game because there's no boss, but uh, I like to view it that the boss is the time limit because you're, you're given a much shorter time limit than any other stage in the game. And kind of you're trying to rush to get to the castle before it runs out. Uh, the harpies that drop off uh, flea men are random, and they're much they're much bigger deal in hard mode because they're taking two hits oh. instead of one. So um, yeah, these spawns are, are random, so he's getting trolled a little bit. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the gargoyles still only have one health. Five two. It's a pretty straightforward stage, but because your gen your health is generally very low after doing a lot of damage boosting through five one, he just needs to be really careful not to get hit because most of the enemies here will kill him in one hit. Oh, just like this stage with stage two. This is another stage where there's no like orb grab for this one, but it does transition to the harder part of the game. Mm -hmm. where, starting from this point on, enemies take one more hit of damage on top of hard mode. Right, so stage six, one of the longer stages in the game. For a screen of 6-1, fairly straightforward, is just uh, trying to avoid these Axe Knights to deal with the bats too. But then after this is one of the uh, most difficult bits of movement in the entire run, which is the chandelier's room. So we're going to give Joe some uh, some quiet time to uh, make some very, very insanely uh, tight jumps and ring whip grabs. said making it making it across without having to wait any extra cycles on the chandeliers is very very difficult and uh, like each each swinging cycle is about four and a half seconds I want to say so um, it does add up if you uh, have to wait at all and, and taking a death there is unfor very unfortunate too because it's sending you all the way back to the start of 6-1 but um, once he gets past the chandelier room there is a hidden room that I imagine he'll be going into in order to uh, to get his cross back Oh. This is just showing how absolutely rude hard mode. Yeah, because I believe there are some more axe knights in the screen than in. Uh, There's like an extra oh, few of them. He, yeah, one or two. And he's having to deal with them without it, without a sub weapon at this point too, which makes it even harder. Yeah, those axe knights die relatively quick if you could stack crosses on them. With, yeah, but if with, with just the whip, just fighting them is, would be really, really slow. I don't know. Sometimes no choice. an extra cycle there isn't too yeah too terrible it's only about six seconds added on that in my opinion is the hardest strat in speed running this game one cycling the chandeliers mm -hmm. yeah i know dismounting the um the whip ring is one of the harder parts of the whole room too I like this secret room just because of having the unique enemy too with the uh, the ghost dog. He gets so sad when you take out his yeah. dog. I feel bad every time I watch. <laughs> right? <laughs> Gotta go fast though. 
All right, so thanks to the secret room, and not just where he not just got the cross, but also used it on a lot of the candles there to get his uh, double shot back quick. He's now back in uh, full fighting shape to uh, finish off stage six. Coming up with, got a bat boost here to skip having to uh, climb those stairs. And these bats do spawn based on Simon's height, so he is doing a lot of subtle manipulation all throughout the run as far as manage knowing where the bats spawn and just jumping in some cases to manipulate it. So I know for a 6-3, he does want to make take extra care not to take damage from the red skeletons because they do more damage than the white ones. Ghost hands, and if you touch them, they, they grab you. They all start attacking you, yeah. But yeah, those flashing skeletons don't do anything unless the ghost hands grab you. So, getting through the coffin ring optimally, another pretty difficult part of stage six. Yeah. How much damage you take from the coffin ring kind of sets up the rest of the uh, screen, too, as far as kind of how much caution needs to be taken with the randomly spawning ghost dancers. Yeah. And the ghouls are like based on RNG. Rarely random. Fortunately, there is some health coming up right before the boss. All right, so say hi to Paula Abghul and Fred Iscare. And say adieu. It's a flying boss that has the unfortunate tendency of moving kind of approximately the same speed as your crosses. So with the right uh, with the right cross throws, they're just constantly taking damage from kind of the returning and returning crosses. So the first screen here just has so many enemies, and I'm just gonna try to use as many of these crosses uh, optimally. He's getting good luck. That's yeah, that spear knight is it has random movement that can, can be a problem. Yeah, there's just like, you see all these ghosts that are just, uh, you, you want to jump over these axe knights, but these ghosts are like spawning almost perfectly to keep you from doing that, so uh, you handle that perfectly. This last guy can be a little bit trolly, but ultimately going down the stairs. Yeah, there is some meat on the screen, thanks for me. Along with just being able to just drop all the way down if you know where the platforms are. So let's see about the X Knight. Yeah, so X Knight X Knights can either throw high or low axes, and if that particular one throws a, a low axe, then he can uh, Joe can take a damage boost off of it to get onto the book faster. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> These carpet critters, as I call them, and their their gimmick is that if you're standing on one at certain points, it can push you up into spikes, which are instant death. So you need to do some kind of tight ducks to uh, to avoid those. That unique enemy that just seems to solely exist in order to lag the game. Hey, look how many sprites we can throw on screen. <laughs> Yeah, Super Castlevania 4 was a pretty early Super Nintendo game, so uh, Konami did a lot did a lot of stuff just to kind of show what they could do with the new hardware. A lot of like stage four in particular. Painting grab them for a bit stuff for a little bit. Nice fight with Sir Draco. There's a couple patterns he can give that can be a little problematic, but we didn't, I don't think we saw any of them. 
But now we're coming on to stage eight, which is one of the stages that I'm sure pretty much everybody that's played this game has gotten stuck on for a while too, because uh, stage eight is a, uh, is a torture chamber dungeon where um, pretty much everything kills you in one hit. <laughs> every, every, everything with spikes on it is instant death. And there's just a lot of really, really precise, tight damage boosts in this stage, and every one of them, you're usually a pixel and or a frame away from death, even if you pull it off perfectly. If anyone's wondering why the uh, acid is red instead of green, by the way, too, it's because he's playing the Japanese version of the game. Uh, there's no gameplay differences between the two, but the, uh, there's a lot of minor graphical changes in the color of the acid and blood is, uh, is the big one. There were a lot of, like, religious symbols removed in terms of, like, crosses on tombstones and that kind of thing. Okay. Ooh! with a lot of these instant death spikes, and I don't blame him. Nice trick there to uh, wait for that acid droplet in order to despawn a second bone dragon that would normally load uh, right afterwards. And some wall meat there to get almost up to full. Yeah, it's such a relief to get that wall meat in a hard mode. Just getting your life all the way back up to where you want it to be. Screen of 8-2, kind of like 7-1, just if you know where the platforms are, you can drop through. And you can also, you can duck, you can crouch walk in this game and use that to clip through stairs. Very nice there. That's actually fairly tight as far as uh, getting down to, to avoid having to either wait a cycle on the uh, spikes or damage boost through them. All right, and then after these uh, lances here, we have the Vegas Bridge, which is a randomly appearing and disappearing bridge. And uh, whether whether he has to wait age for platforms or not is totally random and a huge, huge run killer in PB or world record attempts. But after all of the horrors and pain of stage eight, fortunately, uh, Frankenstein's monster, not too big a problem with the cross. <laughs> So after stage eight uh, comes stage nine, and this one is one of the luckier stages. Uh, very nice to look at, but it's going to be throwing a lot, a lot of. Uh, yeah, a lot of these golden skeletons can yeah can be can be problematic too. Like I know with this one coming up right here. If it moves left, uh, you want to make sure it dies. Everything in the game, like can throw at Joe right now, it's gonna do it. It's gonna be the lag, it's gonna be all these projectiles and bats coming at him real fast. Yeah, for this screen right here too, these crumbling platforms lag the game a lot too, so it's having to deal with that is, uh, is very challenging. Oh, baby. <laughs> it's always a... Uh... Yeah, I think there's more bats here, too. That's, hard that section is always nerve-wracking, because those projectiles are still on the screen. It's just lagging everything. Yes, yeah, so we let the coffin push him forward so he could clear up the bone dragon before he ran out of the stability frames. Yeah, that's a nice health strat. Uh, he's throwing that across, so he hits the candle. He doesn't have to stop. Oh, nice! Man. Nice spike jump. That yeah. is pixel perfect. I can't tell you. Like, yeah, I know. Shoutouts to a runner named Two Cat for finding a uh, a buffer set up for it by throwing crosses. Don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I, I swear to you, you try that, you will lose your life. Yeah, and then just like the end of stage three and uh, the end in nine two. The screen only scrolls up, so um, there's a couple places, again, where if he gets knocked away by a bad hit from a skeleton or one of their bones, then that's death. Coming up on this next boss, Staff Bat, he's going to have to deliver a specific amount of hits when the bat does its uh, 
swoop down towards the players so he can break the bat apart at a specific time and yeah, keep 20, the three 20, 22 together. hits is when Zap's bat breaks up into three smaller bats, and he really wants to uh, arrange it so that he, as soon as the bat splits up, it'll he can throw three crosses and then kill the three small bats for one salvo. That height looks good. That looks good. Yeah. Very nice. Nice point. Oh. And a nice try for us to boot, too. Yeah, and uh, another little minor thing, too, is that um, he wants to end stages where he has this countdown with as close to zero hearts as he can, too, just because the game will get, will converts your hearts into bonus points uh, when you, at the end of most stages, and he wants to minimize the time as much as possible. So stage A is the kind of obligatory clock tower stage in a Castlevania game. Yet another stage where there's a lot of lag that's only kind of made uh, more so because of the extra enemies for playing on hard mode. <laughs> I can just hear the Super Nintendo crying out in pain. <laughs> Work At least being... they were smart enough to put the yeah, sound CPU right. separate so it doesn't lag the music. Yeah, that would be unforgivable to have uh, bloody tears. Be, uh... What? Nice Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, man. Come on. Get out of here with That's that. clearly cheating. <laughs> yes, again, he's able to do that um, whip ring glitch by jumping over the ring and whipping down so that it kind of pushes him uh, away in the same direction. Yeah, that's a very tight window to hit that ring. These Bone Dragons and Axe Knights all have a lot of health normally, and you, I think even more so in hard modes. So he's just trying to avoid everything, either naturally or through damage boosting. I think the game was actually running at about three frames a second for a little bit there. I love that floor clip, just getting the whip ring to... Oh, yeah. Nice. Wow. Yeah. nice. Yeah. All right, so 8 A-2 is pretty trivial, just a bunch of skeletons. Now we're coming up on probably the most random boss in the game, which is the mummy. So there's four different spawn points. Uh, unfortunately, you got a, didn't get either the left or right edge of the screen, which is optimal for going for a one cycle. Because the cross is returned to you after hitting the edge of the screen. So if the mummy spawns either at the far left or the far right, um, he's able to uh, just stack the crosses fast enough to uh, kill it in one cycle. And on top of the spawn patterns, it's random whether the mummy does bandages or fireballs, too, and that's a factor in getting the one cycle kill, too. That's only one stage left, although it's a doozy. Stage B has some of the, uh, some of the tightest jumps and platforming in the run, followed by uh, four final boss fights. got a crumbling bridge here with uh, bats that will spawn and follow you. I mean, the bats aren't going to hit him if he keeps moving, but he's going to try to diagonal whip to kill as many as possible to reduce lag. Along with just accumulating as many hearts as he can, too, because he has four bosses to, to kill to end the run, and he, he just wants as many hearts as he can for uh, going for quick kills with the cross on them. Casually, this is a very brutal part of the game. Yes. Any mistakes, then you just get trapped and will inevitably die by a big spiked wheel. Yeah, because if he falls off any of these falling staircases, then that's that's death. Basically, if you can't uh, if you can't make make a jump back to get back up. It's also important to note he's collecting uh, big hearts along the way. That skeleton's such a troll. <laughs> very nicely done. Here we go. Joe's rolling right. deep. <laughs> rolling super deep. Yeah. And there's, this is the last kind of place where there's extra enemies from hard mode that present challenge in the speedrun. Oh! Ooh. 
Yeah, unfortunately, taking a death here is very, very bad because of losing losing the cross. He is able to get a uh, backup one and actually do a pretty uh, pretty cool uh, trick in order to um, get his uh, multiplier back too. Because uh, again, you need to get ten hits with um, a sub weapon in order to get a, uh, a double or triple shot for it, and it doesn't really work out to. Uh, be able to get a triple back after the cross, but once you've spawned the uh, the multiplier, the game doesn't care what weapon it goes towards. So he's, he picks up the dagger here and then uses it to get hits. And then optimally, what's going to happen is that he's going to spawn the the triple shot and then get the cross and then get the triple shot, basically. So then he has the triple shot cross for the uh, for the final four boss fights. Make sure not to get killed by the spike wheel, though. Alright, so the, the candle on the right has the backup cross on it. Now, uh, unfortunately, the uh, math with the uh, hits didn't quite work out to get the uh, get the triple. But having a cross is better than not for for the uh, for the final bosses. They can at least get a double in time. And then he will be able to, uh, if he needs to, use a, uh, a kind of a well-known secret uh, to get, get his triple for Dracula. And these, these jumps are so tight in order to make it to the left edge before uh, you get the spikes and the those spikes have some really misleading hitboxes. Yeah. All right, so we've got Slogra, the first of the final four bosses. He's gonna have to kind of improv this fight a little bit too, because of not having his triple cross. Because there's a, there's a, there's a, I believe a six cycle quick kill that uh, he normally goes for as far as kind of stacking the crosses inside Slogra's hitbox. Because uh, the way you're intended to do this is just to, yeah, just to do kind of this, basically, where you get one uh, one hit per jump that Slogra does. And with uh, good cross placement, you can turn like I don't know, like about, like a 20 cycle fight or so casually into a six. Slogra looking really generous today. Yeah, because once once his spear breaks, he can either uh, he does that beat charge attack and. He can do it immediately after landing, which is really uh, dangerous. Next up is Gaibon here. Probably the easiest of the final four bosses. Next up is Death, the Grim Reaper, and this is probably going to be the, uh, the the most difficult of the three to do uh, without being without having enough parts and crosses to do the quick kill. He should, with his seven hearts, he should be able to still at least get some uh, get some free hits right at the start. We got some bad luck right there. Randomness with death too, whether he does that swoop attack or uh, just kind of descends and then does this suction. Pull you in for fair dance. Okay, a little minor time save. Joe's gonna go for it too. Is actually to try to jump to the left. Uh, very nice. Uh, when the screen would normally freeze him, and that saves like a second or so, just of pure movement. All right, so all that's left before the end of the game is the Dracula fight. So yeah, in order to be uh, kind of fully uh, fully armed to fight Dracula, he's going to this secret area here, which gives you uh, max hearts, max health, and uh, triple shot cross. Spare no expense. I remember reading about that in Nintendo Power back in the day and having my mind blown. <laughs> So the idea on this fight is going to be to preemptively throw crosses so that you can stack as many cross hits on Dracula in addition to your whip hits per cycle as you can. Yeah, some kind of rough RNG as far as where Dracula is spawning. You know, the edges of the screen are somewhat bad as far as the number of hits he's able to get per cycle. 
So every fourth teleport, I believe, Dracula will spawn directly on top of you two, so you can use that to your advantage to manipulate his uh, position. Dracula gives you snacks mid-fight, too, which is nice. Yeah. Really generous. He's a generous host. He wants yeah. to make sure you're not hungry. Exactly. <laughs> now he can eat our crosses. <laughs> then time isn't going to be at the last bit. It's when Joe gets the final orb. All right, and that's it. And that's Castlevania. All right, crowd, can Castlevania. we get one final orb as he's grabbing this? <laughs> I want to say uh, Joe's a very brave man for bringing back hard mode. Uh, <laughs> definitely not the easiest thing to do. In Just to beat this at all, much marathon. less to do it in under 40 minutes. All right, guys, let us hear it. <laughs> Time. <laughs> And with that, that is TV4 hard mode. Well played to Joe. This is not an easy run, and he made it look very, very much so. He put in a lot of hard work. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty rough category to be going through, but uh, he, he did it. <laughs> That's it, unless anybody else has any uh, shadows. Got anything you want to say, Joe? I just want to say thanks to everyone for being here. Thanks to Games Done Quick for giving me the opportunity to run here. I've done multiple runs over the years here. Uh, some of the best friends that I've made in my entire life have been from this entire community. So if everyone else feels the same way, just give one more round of applause. Just not for this, but for everybody. <laughs> Clap for everybody. Everybody here. Let's hear it one more time for Joe and his absolutely amazing run of Super Castlevania IV. We're gonna take a quick break, so don't go away. $50 from NT138. Here's 50 from my grandma, who I introduced to AGDQ last year. She was blown away by what an amazing event AGDQ is and has been patiently waiting for me to update her on the next video game telethon. So here's the first donation from her during one of my favorites, Castlevania. And with that, we're gonna kick things over to an interview with Fiesel. Hello everyone, I'm Fiesel, and I'm here with the runners of Punch-Out! 
uh, AKA Bonus Game 2, which might possibly be coming up after Pokemon Sapphire. And all that depends on whether the incentive is met to get this bonus game added to the marathon. So right now, the donation goal for this is $75,000, which is a lot. Yes. Uh, and we're not quite halfway there yet. Just over 32,000 has been put in. So we need, you know, 40 something thousand uh, remaining to finish that out during Pokemon Sapphire, which fortunately is a long enough game that I think we can get it. What do you guys think? Will we hit that? I think we can get it, yeah. especially yeah. if I mention it's actually Mike Tyson's punch. It's out. Mike Tyson's yes. punch. Not out. just yeah, punch not out. Some, like, not just regular punch yeah. out. No, no, no. It's really no, absolutely. Mike, Mike Tyson, Tyson himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Mike Tyson's punch out. It's probably one of the most uh, well-known GDQ games. It's like iconic, and famous. You know, for the great things you've done in the past. You both run it. You both run it blindfolded. What are you going to do this time to to top that? So we're going to do a category that's, as, as far as I know, never been done before, which is yeah. two players, one controller. Blindfolded, so we're we're mixing yeah. we're mixing two categories <laughs> yes. together. You don't yeah, see that very yeah. often, uh, but we're going to give it a shot. Wow, that's impressive. I never even considered that that would be something that someone would do. Um, so, how exactly when you have two players, one controller, how do you divide the controls up between the two of you? So, I am on D-pad, Sinister is on A, B, and Start, and Select, and Select. Might need that one. Might need that one for <laughs> a couple of special reasons, but yeah. So you're uh, mostly the D-pad is mostly for dodging, right? But there's uh, anything else that we're using it Dodging, for? ducking, no. blocking, mm -hmm. uh, any of those maneuvers, I'm um, in charge of them. Anything besides punching? Yes. All right, so you're going to beat this entire game without throwing a single punch. I don't know about that. May there might be an exception. There might be an, there exception. Might be an exception. All right, wow. Keep an eye out. For okay, it. yeah, we won't spoil it. Okay. I also wouldn't assume that we'll beat the whole game. Oh, that's, I that's would. Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm setting the bar high. Not only will this get met, you'll beat this whole All game. All right. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I have to ask, how did you practice for this? This seems like something that really takes a lot of like being there in person and just intensely practicing. But were you able to do that? Uh, we we live like relatively close to mm -hmm. each other, yes. so we were able to get in some practice prior to the event, and then of course we've done some some on-site practice mm -hmm. as well. Uh, it's not like a typical GDQ; you can kind of practice as much as you want, which is sure. really nice, and then you feel really prepared for your run. That's not mm -hmm. our situation. Yeah. So we're you know we're we're not feeling like. Oh yeah, we're super prepared right yeah. now, but we've we've done what we can. Yeah, it seems like um, communication is sort of a, a big thing here. The two in any you know two player one controller thing, but uh, like how do you work the communication out? Is this just something that happens organically, or do you have like a plan for it? We have a lot of plans, but there there will be times where there might be a situation depending on random events that have happened. Yeah. When, you know, sinister might say something like one, three, something. You know, and I'll know, like, oh, that means hearts or, you know, stars or something. Right. Okay. Well, that's cool. It'd be interesting to hear. I hope we get to hear you guys talking to each should, other. That'd be... Should be able to, yeah. Yeah, I think that's kind of fascinating. Yeah. Um, so what do you think is the biggest challenge with this category? I mean, I'm sure the whole thing is really challenging, but what do you think is the biggest uh, under these constraints? Um, so just blindfolded punch out on its own is really difficult. Mm -hmm. But the thing is just that... Uh, you know, any mistake, you get punished really hard for it. But with this, if either of us make a mistake, then it's just like the punishment's amplified because right. we're trying, we're struggling to try to regain composure and, you know, take control of the fight again. So any mistake is just going to make everything <laughs> really chaotic. So and, and there is a lot of randomness, too. So, yes. you know, even if we're playing well, we might not get favorable patterns. That's going to make things harder on us. And uh, yeah, definitely what Zallard said. I mean, when you anytime you're doing a co-op game, mm -hmm. uh, there's twice as much likelihood of making mistakes. You got two people involved, so you know you have to you have to trust your teammate. I trust this guy with my life. He's yep. on the D-pad. He's making sure we don't get right. hit. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna do our best on that. Absolutely. So between the two-player one controller and the blindfolded part, like which aspect of that do you think is more challenging? If, if you can even I would, I would pick say one. The, I would say the blindfolded part. I mean, we, we so, uh, you know, originally we, we did do a two-player, uh, one-controller run with sight. Right. And we were able to do it, but then you add in the blindfolded feature, and then it be obviously becomes exponentially harder. So yeah. I would say, yeah, any, and doing anything blindfolded is going to be tough. <laughs> yeah. So if you just sat down two-player, one-controller, but with your eyes, you could, you could actually see you would nail Tyson. Yeah. No um, problem. I mean, it would. It, we would be confident that, okay. like, we'll probably finish the right. game. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that seems. Yeah. Pretty reasonable. Um, so, what happens if you lose a fight during this run? So this is like this is nothing like the previous blindfolded runs. What we're gonna do, um, say we lose to Tyson. Typically, what happens? You just game over immediately. Mm -hmm. We're gonna password to Tyson. 
Um, if we lose to someone like Super Macho Man, for example, he sends you back a couple fights. So we're going to password to Macho because we want to just keep everything moving along. Mm -hmm. um, if we lose anybody else, we can, you can just rematch them immediately. Yeah. So there's no need to password or anything like right, that. Right, right. But we'll, we'll, we'll play up to like three losses, which is traditionally that's how many losses you would get before your uh, game over. Yeah. Are you going to do password blindfolded as well? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, we have to, right? Awesome, awesome. That's <laughs> we got to do it. <laughs> see that? I hope I don't have to see that, but that will be cool to see <laughs> yeah. if that does happen. <laughs> All right. Uh, how confident are you you're going to beat Tyson? Oh, man. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's get hard just to get to Tyson. Yeah, getting but... to Tyson is already a challenge in and of itself. 50-50. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right, that's pretty good. I mean, that's, I don't know. I, I'm going to be surprised if you, if you beat Tyson. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. I'm completely confident. You got Tyson now. You got this, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, um, we are running out of time here, but before we get on to Pokemon Sapphire, I want to talk about uh, one of the prizes that we have for it. Sent is gradually making his way in here. There you go. So we have this lovely Pokemon cross stitch with all the Gen 1 Pokemon represented here. This was provided to us by uh, Christina Heiberg. And this is a $25 minimum donation during any part of the Pokemon Sapphire run. So during this next run, $25 or more could give you a chance to win this. So I don't know, you can see all the detail that went into that. It is a beautiful piece and absolutely worth donating for. So there you go. Donate during the coming run. You could win that. And without further ado, we are going to throw it over the front where we have Pokemon Sapphire coming up uh, with Gunner Maniac. What is up, GDQ 2020? I am your host, Sporadic Erratic, otherwise known as the Floppy Hat Girl. Coming up, we have an amazing...